Bill Monroe, after uh, World War I, says a, when he was a child, he used to hang out in the woods next to the railroad track, and the World War I vets were coming home. And he would watch them as they walked along the tracks, and there was a sound that captured his soul. It was a high, lonesome sound. Sometimes the men, when they were coming home, would let out a holler. And it was piercing, this high-pitched kind of holler that was lonesome and free at the same time, that was sad and heavy-hearted, but with an opening of hope in it. Bill Monroe went on to become the, known as the father of bluegrass music. And you may have heard those kinds of hollers in the music before. But I think we can kind of relate and almost hear that high, lonesome sound sometimes, you know, in our world today. So maybe you yourself are sometimes the one letting out the holler, <laughs> literally or metaphorically, right? I encourage literally because, you know, that's also how we heal is getting it out there, right? Moving through those great equalizers of grief that all of us can relate to. And when we think about that sound or that soundtrack that is sometimes available in our world today, there is also that piece of it that I mentioned that has some freedom in it, has some hope and some light in it too, right? And that's a, a way back, isn't it? It's a way back to our connection. Because we all know that in truth we are connected, right? Connected to our source, connected to each other, connected to all of life. And aren't we getting a great opportunity in our world today to practice that second principle of unity, that there is an innate divinity in all of us, within ourselves and within each other? I mean, it was hard enough to find it, right? Within ourselves. The, you know the old story, the Hindu, the Hindu tradition, the, the legend has it that Brahman and all the gods were gathered after humanity had been stripped of its divinity because we had misused our powers. And so Brahman was gathered with all the gods and saying, okay, well, we're going to hide it somewhere on earth. Where should we hide it? And some of the gods said, well, bury it deep into the earth. And he said, nope, humans will find it. They'll dig deep in the earth and they'll find God again. And so somebody said, well, put it really deep in the sea. He said, nope, humans will find a way to dive deep in the sea, and they're going to find God again. All right, I've got it, one of the gods said. Way up high in the mountains. They'll figure out a way to climb those mountains. They'll climb every single one of them. Anybody here of the 14er club? Yeah. <laughs> and indeed we have. And so then finally Brahman got still and said, I know. We will hide it deep inside of themselves. They will never think to look there. <laughs> and we've been looking ever since. <laughs> but then we brush up with that truth, right? We have these experiences of the presence. And sometimes, often in fact, those experiences are together, like the one we just had when we were singing. It's that recognition of the divinity in all of us and that, as Brene Brown, the author of our book in this series says, that inextricable human connection, that unbreakable, in other words, connection that we all have to one another. You know, some of us, if we've been on this faith walk long enough, we get that we're never separate from God, never separate from divinity, but it's, it's kind of a hard walk some days, isn't it, to realize that we're also never separate from each other even those with whom we strongly disagree, which is a lot of what our work together has been on this series because it's a lot of what the work is in the world today. So really working our second principle is what is called for, our unity second principle that says there is a spark of divinity in everyone. And so recognizing that and then walking that talk and seeing it everywhere present and looking through and past some of the stuff that gets in the way is the work that we're called to do. And also that really human, that really open-hearted way of listening to that call of the high lonesome and knowing that when we hear that call, it is a call 
in a way, call for help or a call for connection and to be providers of that connection or to recognize it in our own hearts when our own hearts feel like they're, they're calling out in a way to recognize what do I need? What is that call I'm making for true connection and how can I find a way to bridge that? How can I find a way to experience that? You know, Joseph Campbell said that the second law of life is survival, but the first law is that we are all one. And so we may think it's all about survival, but we've learned, too, that it's not survival of the fittest, but survival of the whole species, right? We are social beings wired to care about each other, wired to have compassion and to help our neighbor, it's natural for us. And you know it happens every time you see a tragedy happen, right? Every time there's a, a flood or a hurricane or a fire or anything like that, we band together. You know, we help our neighbors. And you can see the goodness that is in humanity when those things happen. We also do it in collective mo moments of joy, right? In moments when we're all gathered together to watch our favorite band or our favorite uh, team. And there is that sense of heightened energy. And Brene Brown says these are the keys. Actually, the research, the social research is showing up to tell us that these collective moments of joy and pain is what brings us back to the truth, what reminds us again of our, our unbreakable connection to one another. So that's what we're really all about, is making our way back. Anybody ever see the movie Lars and the Real Girl? Oh, one person. Well, a, lot of, oh, a few people over here. OK. First service, nobody, it seemed like, had heard of it. So um, it's been around for a while. And um, in Lars and the Real Girl, the main character is living in the garage of his brother and his sister-in-law, and he's very isolated. He's really isolated himself. Well, he finally realized he needs some connection, and so online he, he sends for a doll. And this doll, this life-size doll, Bianca, becomes his girlfriend. And it gets him out into the community, and he starts, you know, taking Bianca on dates and... <laughs> She's got different outfits, and, um, and, and, and so the brother and the sister-in-law say, you know, what are we going to do with Lars, you know? So they go to the psychotherapist, and she says, play along. Just, just let Bianca be his real girlfriend for a while. He will move through this. And indeed, that's exactly what happens. So, you know, she's propped up at the dinner table with a plate of food in front of her, and they're having a couple's dinner, you know, there's just... Bianca goes everywhere. I think she went ice skating in one scene. So, yeah, <laughs> can't remember how that all went. I, it's been a while since I've seen the movie. But anyway, so then it, when Lars is ready, Bianca becomes ill. And she actually goes to the hospital, and he sits by her bedside and grieves. And then she dies. And all the townspeople have, have joined in on this very compassionate act of allowing Lars to have Bianca be his girlfriend and, and honoring her as such. And so when she dies, the priest gives a memorial. And I mean, people are crying. I mean, it's beautiful. This movie is really beautiful. They have a burial. And then Lars is ready, you know, to have a real relationship with a real girl. <laughs> and so a coworker that he's had a spark with, eventually that turns into a relationship. But in the meantime, right after Bianca the doll dies, the women from the town show up at Lars's door with casseroles. <laughs> right? This is what we do for each other. And they're knitting. And they sit around with Lars in his living room, and they give him a plate of food, and they start knitting. And they say, this is what we do, Lars, when tragedy st strikes. We come together, and we sit with each other. Isn't that beautiful? And isn't that what we do? That's, we get how to do this. There's nothing we don't already know how to do, right? And it's the, it's the challenges that are before us and the great joys that are before us that bring us together. To sit with one another in silence. You know, I've heard people say, well, I don't know what to say to so-and-so. They just lost their best friend. And it's like, you don't have to say anything. <laughs> you know, it's your presence. It's your being there. 
And it's the trusting that if there is something to be said, it will be said. Brene Brown has interviewed so many people and always she said in the top three reasons why somebody trusts somebody is because they came to the memorial service of somebody that that person cares about. Yeah, lots of yeses. We get it, right? Because it's like when the rubber hits the road, you get to know who your friends are. Another thing was that people remembered the names of people that were important to you, like your, your family members or your close friends. It, it builds trust because you know that person took time to care, to listen, to connect. So it is these collective moments of joy and pain that are really our way back or one of our ways back. Do you know Oriah Mountain Dreamer? She's an author and, and spiritual teacher. And she, right after 9-11, she talked about the importance of relanguaging. She said that at that time, particularly the people outside of our country were looking at us and calling the Americans they and the terrorists they. And they were referring to, the, trying to make sense of it all and saying, well, the terrorists, they just don't understand freedom. Or the Taliban, they just hate our way of life. And the Americans, well, they just want to go bomb somebody because they're mad, you know. And she said, how about we take the they and them language and we shift it to some of us. Some of us don't really understand freedom. Some of us don't like the lifestyle of capitalism. Some of us want to just go bomb somebody because we're so mad. Really shifts it, doesn't it? And it shifts us into that piece of oneness where we recognize, yes, all of us <laughs> are capable at times of thinking in such ways that we are surprised by that, either in, in a positive or a negative way, right? And it shifts us into the recognition that we all have the capacity to show up in certain ways and that we are all one. And so when one of us sort of loses their way we have the opportunity to bring that one back into the circle. Or when one has a great triumph, we don't look at it as a comparison of, oh, they did well and I'm not doing so well, but we thrill for them because they are also a part of us. You know, the first symbol that children make all over the world when they draw every culture? The circle. It is a natural way of coming together for us. You know, it's as old as humanity that we would gather around from the very beginnings of making fire and tell stories and hold hands and dance and sing and talk about what was best for the community and work through the issues that had come up through the week. It's always the way for humanity because it is natural for us to be connected in such a way. And so then our work is maybe relanguaging or different ways that we can remember and find our way back to oneness. And it's true that when great things happen in our world that we are sort of shaken to the core and we see and feel these moments of how it is that we are naturally and inextricably connected. Dr. Brown talks about the Challenger, when the Challenger crashed, and she lives in Houston, so her neighbors and friends and colleagues were all a part of that NASA effort to launch Christy McAuliffe, the first teacher, and others into space, right? And she describes how she was driving, and it was a four-lane highway, and she was driving in Houston, and she said she couldn't understand what was going on because people were slowing down, and some people were even stopping in the middle of the road. And she didn't know what was happening, so she kept looking in her side view mirror and her rear view mirror, looking for the emergency, emergency vehicles, you know. And so finally, she said she pulled up and she saw this man who had pulled over, and he just had his head on the steering wheel. And he was looking really sad, and she thought, wow, I've got to pull over and turn the radio on. Maybe we're at war. And when she did, she heard about the Challenger crashing, and she just said, no, 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 and started to cry. And she said she looked around, and people were just getting out of their cars, you know, just sort of wandering around, wanting to, needing to hold hands with strangers, to feel that sense of connection. We're in this together. My grief and your grief, our hearts are meeting, because it, that can never be broken, and we need each other. 
And so it's in those moments that what do we care about politics in those moments, right? What do we care about what the, the guy in the truck feels or what I feel? Because right now I just need that human connection, that sense of we're in this together. And she said for, after everybody was ready to move on, she said, nobody on the radio said, turn your lights on, but everybody just got it. And she said it was just like this procession of grief together that everybody turned their headlights on. And we know on the flip side, there are those moments when we're at like big musical events or sporting events, how there is that raised up energy, right? Just to, I mean, Brenly and I went, we didn't, I, I have to admit, I wasn't really tracking the Super Bowl and I didn't, I didn't even know who was playing. <laughs> And she really wanted to be in the energy. She's like, well, let's go somewhere and watch some of it, you know? And I was like, all right. So we went down to the local bar and grill, you know? And it was so fun. It was like, Phillies, yeah! We were like all in it, right? <laughs> because it's that energy, right? It's just that, yeah, we're all in this together and it's fun. And it's that, ex that, that lifting us up and recognizing the connection that we have. And it's about face-to-face -face connection, too. You know, this is an important point these days, isn't it? Susan Pinker, a researcher, said that she wrote a book called The Village Effect, how face-to-face -face contact can make us healthier and happier. And in it, she says that in a short evolutionary time, we've actually changed from group living primates who were so tuned to every little gesture. We were so skilled at reading each other's gestures and, and intentions to solitary individuals who are just attuned to our own screens. You know, so, so it's almost like we're trying to break the connection, the unbreakable connection in some ways. And of course, while technology unites us in many ways, it also can create this, and we all know this, right? We're <laughs> We can both be guilty of it and having seen it. You know, people practically walk into holes in, in streets and out into traffic staring at their screens, you know. So, so there is that sense of isolation. So it's about face-to-face -face contact. And she says the research bears out that when we have face-to-face -face contact, all these physical improvements happen. Our immune systems are boosted and that uh, this surge of positive hormones comes through our bloodstream and our brain. So we actually live longer, as we talked about some research earlier in the series about loneliness and how people who report high levels of loneliness actually have shorter lives. So it's like, you know, it's back to this understanding that, that we do need each other. And we've had so, you know, you begin to think about it. It's like anything else, like beginning to think of your blessings. Suddenly there's, you know, I just can the list keeps going in my mind of all the ways we connect collectively. And the collective, um, the collective connections that I have been a part of recently. And a lot of them have been interfaith, which has been really beautiful. You know, at the, the Women's March, there was an interfaith celebration right before we had a Shabbat service led by one of the female rabbis from Temple Isaiah. And I didn't know these people. We didn't know each other. And we all had our arms on each other's shoulders and we were singing Jewish songs together. And it was the most beautiful gathering, you know, just to kind of get ready and talk about what we were for and march together for equality and inclusivity and love and kindness and connection, right? Now, of course, yes, yeah, some people bring their signs that aren't it's so kind, and that's the space they're in. That's all right. That's, you know, doesn't mean we love anybody any less. It's just, you know, we're all about that kind of lifting up. And so those are the experiences that we really want to nurture and hang on to and create more of and put ourselves into more. Some of you were here on Thursday night for the Interfaith Harmony service. And wasn't that a lovely, uh, the energy was just mm, so nice, yeah. And there was a field set, you know, as we came together, brothers and sisters of different faiths and experienced ceremony together and prayers together. And the depth of sharing, you know, was uh, out of that field comes vulnerability. When we create, when we come together like that and we create the kind of field that says it's safe here, it's loving here. There's something about this place that we get to offer to the rest of, of the world. It was such a, also an honor for us, I think, to open our unity home and say you are all welcome and to hear the stories that came. 
And you know, one of the stories that stuck with me was something I heard that morning at the Interfaith Dialogues from uh, Marum from the Islamic Center. She was telling me about how Muslim women and Jewish women and Christian women started coming together in women's circles. And it wasn't then just about social time, but they wanted to do something together. And so they started talking about how they wanted to bring food to the homeless directly. They wanted to be able to hand bags to particularly homeless women and make the connection eye to eye. And so they started what they call the Purse Project, putting together these small packages of bags of lip balm and sunscreen and snacks and, and delivering it to people one on one. And it has grown. She said the last time they were together was 150 or 200 women. I mean, this is just a local group. And so there were stories like that, feeding children on the, on the breaks and how two women, a Catholic and a Baptist woman, happened to meet and then they decided to have coffee and they, one brought a notebook and one brought a computer and they said, oh, I guess this is a business meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and it just grew into this idea. They noticed that kids in West County weren't being fed on the breaks because normally they have lunch and breakfast at school. They said, what happens when those kids are on break? And so they began, they started something called Let's Feed the Kids. And it just has grown and grown and, and now they feed kids at five different schools and then they met another group that was doing it called Food for Thought that was multi-denominations um, and multi-faiths. And so now the, the two groups have banded together and they've served nine schools and next year they're gonna serve 12 or 15 schools. And so on and on the human connection goes, right? We come together for all different reasons, to just celebrate our favorite team or our favorite band, or to, to do something wonderful in the world in terms of service, or to, to share in our pain or our grief together. But all of it is necessary. And when we do these things, we bear witness to that unbreakable connection, and we bear witness to that human dignity that, that is being when we hear that sort of, or feel that kind of high lonesome kind of call, it's the holler of that, that human dignity cannot be broken, you know? And so where we see it and we feel it, we can say no. <laughs> that line will not be crossed. In fact, I've got something deeper that I can bring here, which is the first law of life that we are all one that we all have this divinity in us. And I can bring forth this gift from new thought that says that the divine is within us all, this gift that comes from ancient Hinduism that says the divine is, in, is within all of us. And we have found it, <laughs> Brahman and the gods. <laughs> and we will let it show and we will let it shine and we will make those connections heart to heart and soul to soul to lift each other up and we will get out of our ideological bumpers, bunkers and put our screens down and we'll go into collective assembly like we are this morning because it is in this collective assembly that we remember again. Isn't that why we come together on Sundays? So we can remember again who we are and how unbreakable the connection is between all of life and how it is our work to remind the others who have forgotten that God is inside of them, that we are connected, and that nothing can ever break that connection, even political differences. <laughs> that we've let it go that far is heartbreaking, isn't it? It's worth one of those high, lon lonesome hollers. <laughs> and to listen for the call back. John, Hugh, John Donahue, the poet, says, only holiness, only holiness will call people to listen now. And the work of holiness, he says, is about belonging. That sense of being in the presence and that mild magnetic of implicating others in the presence. That's it, right? When we all raise up our hands or we light our lighters for another song, you know? <laughs> That's it, isn't it? Those moments. I mean, after reading this chapter, I'm, I'm booking concert, two concerts. Because <laughs> I forgot. I forgot what that feeling's like. I remember as a teen going, wow, this, I didn't even have words for it at the time, but it was like that energy, that collective energy, right? 
But it's not just concerts, it's everything. As I began to think about it, I thought about all these different things, like when I was on the Inca Trail to Machu Picchu with all these strangers, and that moment that we went through the sun gate together, and the mist parted, and it was like an ancient humanity created this amazing mystical place, and the llamas are wandering around, and we're all just, <gasps> You know those moments, or you're down, you're at a Yosemite. I mean, I almost said down the street because it almost feels like it. Yeah. <laughs> I still feel like a kid in a candy store in, in California. So, you know, but it's those moments where everybody just stops and they get out of their cars and they start pointing, and then everyone's where, and then everyone's seeing the waterfall from way up on high. You know, and there's that awe and that beauty and that moment and shared with strangers, but they're not strangers anymore. In that moment, it's like. Oh, yes, this is what it's about. The beauty and the nature and the God that is being revealed. And we get to look together because we have an unbreakable connection. Don't let it break. Don't allow people who believe that it is broken or believe it can be broken to get away with that. Remind them of who they are. This is our work now, to be brave, to get out into the wilderness is what she's talking about. Braving the wilderness is the courage to stand alone, to be the one that says, nope, I'm not okay with us continuing to pretend like we don't belong together. I'm not okay with, with continuing to allow the divide because I know too much about the truth. I know too much about how we are meant to be connected and to care for each other. And so that's the journey we're on, isn't it? It's the reconnection. It's the remembering. That's all. It's just a remembering. It's already here for us. It cannot be broken. So don't ever for a moment again believe that it can. And if you do, remember as soon as you can. And collect with these kinds of folks around you who can remind you. So we continue our journey. We continue our journey of this beautiful, human, spiritual being that we are. Together, we continue. Let's close out with an affirmation. And this is what we do when we gather with others. We make spirit known. And it makes the gods really happy that once hid this truth from us. So together, let's say this. I gather with others, making spirit known. So it is.